Okay, I guess in that case, we can move on. Let's move on to depth estimation. We are gonna start simple. We are gonna assume that you know your ground truth. This is supervised. And then we are gonna end up with some self-supervised techniques later on. Why would you do that? Why do you need depth? Because it's gonna give you a sense of the 3D geometry of your scene, how far the objects are from you. There are some good data sets for us to explore. There is New York University NYU depth data set, and they're using Microsoft Kinetic Camera to actually measure the depth. The other one is Kitty data set. We just saw it for optical flows. You can also use it for depth estimation. And it is based on some depth sensors. An image goes in, it's gonna go through a bunch of convolutions. In the end, you're gonna end up with a fully connected layer. This last layer is probably not familiar to you. The rest of it is, this last layer is a fully connected network. It's gonna output a very long vector, but then you're gonna reshape it into the resolution that you want. In this case, the resolution is gonna end up being 74 by 55. You train that, it's gonna give you a global sense of what is in that image. For instance, every single pixel that is being outputted in the output is looking at every single pixel in the image because of these fully connected layers. So you're gonna look at everything, your entire image. It's gonna give you a coarse estimate of the depth, and then you, you train that independently. Then there is gonna be a second stage of training. This is about looking at fine details. The first layer is convolutional. You are not gonna reduce the resolution from one layer to the next one. You're gonna keep the resolution. At this resolution, you can actually copy the outcome from the global network, concatenate it with the features from the previous layer, push them through your convolutions and then get a refined prediction of the depth, which is 142 by 27. This is four times smaller than your input, which is good enough. So the global coarse scale network is pre-trained on ImageNet. So you're gonna pre-train it up until this point on an ImageNet. You're gonna change the head and then do fine tuning. And its job is to give you a global understanding of the scene. The fine scale network is trained after you train the coarse network. So you're gonna use the results of the coarse network as additional input. There is a catch when it comes to actually writing a loss function or when it comes to writing an evaluation metric for this particular task. And the catch is the global scale of a scene is unknown. It's an ambiguity when it comes to depth prediction. And why is that? Because we know that this uh, object is smaller compared to the other object in the scene, but we don't know their exact sizes. We know their relative sizes. And that's how we are guessing it as human beings. So the same thing, the same problem, the same issue is gonna happen to an artificial intelligence, okay? So how can we deal with that? You need to change your loss function. You need to change your metric to be independent of the scale. Your neural network is gonna predict the depth. You know the corresponding depth. This is the number of pixels in your image. You're gonna index your pixels by I, and then you're gonna write down a scale invariant mean squared error and you're writing it down in log space. So you're gonna first take a log of the predicted depth, a log of the ground truth depth, and then you can subtract them, square them. Without this term, this mean squared error is gonna be scale variant. So it's gonna heavily depend on the scale, which we don't know what that is. To correct for that, you're gonna set alpha to be this number. Alpha is dependent on the prediction and the ground truth. It's the average of the difference between the logs of the prediction and the ground truth. So I'm gonna leave this as an exercise. It's not a hard one. And it's proving that this mean squared error is actually a scale invariant. And to prove that you're gonna multiply y by a scale, let's say you multiply it by two, and then the twos should cancel out out of this formula. You can use that as a metric to measure the performance of your algorithm. You can also use it as a loss function. This is just a rewrite of the formula you have up there when this lambda is one. So di is the differences of the logs, the differences of the logs are showing up there. And then it's just a reformulation of what you have up there. So it's just, you're rearranging the furniture 
and you can use that as your last function. Rather than having the one here, you can have lambda, which is a good number for it is 0 0.5, a half. If you set lambda to be zero, you're gonna end up with a scale variant uh, last function. And if you set lambda to be one, you're gonna end up with this metric you have up there. So you're trying to balance the two. In terms of other evaluation metrics, you can you look at the threshold, you can look at absolute relative difference, squared relative differences, root mean squared error in the linear case, or you take a log first and then write down your root mean squared error, or you can write this scale invariant mean squared error. And we know that data augmentation is important. It is also important when you are doing depth estimation. You can scale your images, but then while you're scaling, you have to be careful. If you scale your input and target images, this is the input, that's the target, for instance. If you scale them in your ground truth, then you need to divide your depth by S. Objects are gonna become S times closer or S times further away. You have to take that into account. Rotation is nice. You don't need to do anything. Translation uh, is not that nice because you're playing around with the scale, but it's not hurting during the translation, which are random crops of your input images. You can play around with the color and then you can flip left and right with probability 0.5. So these are your data augmentation techniques.